Welcome, everyone. This is the Liberty Classroom course, History of Economic Thought 1, Classical Economics and the Marginal Revolution. I'm your instructor, Robert Murphy. and We are now on Lecture 17, William Stanley Jevons. So just to refresh your memory, he is one of the three economists credited with uh, pioneering the Marginal Revolution. I should mention that Murray Rothbard argues that that title for this period in the history of economic thought is a misnomer and that it would be it would make more sense to call it the subjectivist or the subjective revolution so let me just explain where he's coming from there are two differences between the traditional british classical approach to value and price theory and then the new modern approach and one difference is that, yes, the classical economists didn't really have down the issue of marginality. And so with the water-diamond paradox, quite famously, Adam Smith brought up the fact that, hey, it's odd that we know goods are ultimately valued because of their usefulness to humans, and yet why is it that water has such a low price in the marketplace? whereas diamonds have such a high price since water is much more useful to humans than diamonds are. And so, yep, the way you solve that in a snap with a new approach is to think on the margin. And so that is, a, that is a major difference, and that's why it actually ended up being called the marginal revolution. However, Rothbard points out that, especially through the lens of Karl Menger's work, which is acknowledged by everyone to be one of the three... Uh, goalposts of the marginal revolution another huge difference is that now with the modern approach we explain value not in terms of objective things about the empirical world such as how much money did you spend making this item or how many labor hours went into it which are objectively measurable things instead Rothbard points out, what we're doing now is we're getting inside the minds of individuals. That's the starting point of modern value theory. It has to do with marginal utility. So it's not just the marginal part of that phrase, but it's the utility part. We're realizing that, oh, it's not anything intrinsic about commodities themselves that has to do with value. It's ultimately what does the human actor in his or her subjective value scale think about this particular item and so that's why Rothbard thinks that really when you talk want to talk about something being revolutionary that's what was so new was the focus now on the human mind and valuation occurring in the mind as opposed to thinking oh gee if goods out there are trading if this goods twice as expensive as that good there must be some quality about it that's twice as big you know, just like physicists might say, well, gee, we put a thermometer up to this thing and it's reading it twice as much as this one over here on a Kelvin scale. And there must be something physical about the molecules in this thing that's twice as big. And so what, what is that, qu that quantity or that quality that we're going to try to quantify? All right, so it's a completely different approach. And Rothbard's just saying that he thinks it, it undercuts or downplays that aspect of it when we call it the marginal revolution. But that is what it's called. And I just wanted to point that out to you guys. Okay, so William Stanley Jevons, 1835 to 1882. Some biographical remarks. He was born in Liverpool in England. He was studying chemistry and botany at the University College, which is in London. Then his father had a bankruptcy, and Jevons ended up having to go and spend five years as an assayer at a mint in Sydney, Australia, just because of financial concerns. He eventually returns, finishes studies, becomes huge in economic circles because of his path-breaking work. He gets a chair in political economy at University College. Unfortunately, he died at 46. He drowned while he was swimming. Some of his major works, A General Mathematical Theory of Political Economy in 1862, the Coal Question, 1865, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in this lecture. Elementary Lessons on Logic, 1870. 
The Theory of Political Economy, 1871. So that's the one that gets him in with the other two, Menger and Walras, as co-discoverers of marginal, uh, the marginal subjective approach to value and price. And another one that people talk about a lot is The State in Relation to Labor, 1882. I'm not going to dwell on it in this lecture, and I don't think I have a lot in the in the notes for for this lecture. I have excerpts both from the coal question and from the theory of political economy, and I just want to point out that there aren't any mathematical. Um, there, there's no equations or any diagrams that look particularly mathematical in the notes from the theory of political economy that I put in for you guys. So I just want to make sure you understand that that stuff is in there. And and that's also why I included this general mathematical theory of political economy, 1862, in the list of the works to make sure you guys realize that Jevons is one of the early uh, apostles, I guess would be the word, or proponents of using math in economics. And he argues that it's because you know, mathematics, or sorry, that economics is a science dealing with units, you know, there's quantities involved and you have to be very precise and in his opinion, therefore, that's why it's appropriate to use math and not just algebra, but calculus. And you can understand that with, uh, this is the way a lot of economists approach marginal utility using calculus to say, oh, you've got total utility and then from a stock of goods. And then if you add a little bit more of another particular good, What's the delta of total utility? How much does total utility change? And then that's the marginal utility. And then if you really want to figure it out uh, instantaneously, then you, you take that the, the size of the unit of that addition or that increment, you shrink it down to almost zero. And then that's showing like the slope at which total utility is changing along this dimension as you add more of that good, right? So this is very much uh, thinking in terms of calculus. And so that's how a lot of today's economists even who use math and just assume, well, yeah, of course, you go to economics, you're going to study a lot of math, that, that you can find all this in Jevons' 1871 treatment of all this. But it's not in the excerpts that I put for you guys in this uh, lecture, but partly just because I was thinking the formatting might not carry over very well, but also just because it wasn't essential for the logic. Jevons verbally does a very good job, he's a very clear writer, of explaining the problems with the old classical approach and then explaining the new way to think about it. So I, I was focusing on stuff that I thought you guys would uh, benefit from in terms of clarifying your thinking and seeing what's the problem with the old way, how does this new marginal revolution give us a better way to think about value and price. And so when Jevons is writing verbally, at least in large parts of it, it's totally fine even from a modern Austrian perspective. So that's the stuff I was including. Because again, remember, my overall purpose in this course is not simply to give you a bunch of trivia about facts about, oh, and then this guy thought this, and this guy wrote this, and this person did it. But so that when you walk away from this course, you know a lot more about economic theory. Okay, let me mention that Jevons... He, Carl Menger, and Leon Walras are all credited as being the ones who independently discovered this new approach. But if you had to pick one of them to say who had precedence, who did it first, it would have to go to Jevons, that he, uh, in 1862, outlined the, the framework that he was working on uh, in a public lecture. So... Um, yeah, that's in terms of who who told the world about this first of these three. It would be Jevons. But even having said that, I, I just want to, again, stress when it comes to the history of, of ideas, it's almost never the case that you find somebody and say, this is the first person who ever had anything remotely close to this thought, that you can always find precursors. And the same thing here, that there were other economists. Um, after these three published their work, then kind of economists were looking back and saying, oh, wait, you know, so-and-so a few years earlier had written this, and that kind of anticipates what these guys said. So there's that kind of thing, too, that people didn't recognize the genius uh, germs that were located in some of the previous stuff, and it wasn't until Jevons, Menger, and Walras really uh, 
smacked everyone upside the head and said, hey, this is the way to think about it. And people said, yeah, these guys are right. That then you could see, oh, you know, there were others saying similar things back in the day. Again, let me just point out, don't get confused. In these lectures and even in some of my notes, I'm going to be leading you to believe that these early writers in the early 1870s were using the phrase marginal utility. They weren't. All right. It, from our vantage point, we're going to say, oh, yeah, what they mean there is marginal utility, what we now call that. But they use different phrases. All right. So Jevons called it a degree of utility or final degree of utility. All right. So he didn't use the phrase marginal utility. And it was uh, of the major economists we're going to be looking at. It wasn't until Wieser, who was like a disciple of Karl Menger that actually started using the phrase marginal utility. I mean, he didn't write in English, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, let me spend a bit here now on what's called the coal question. So this is a very famous work that Jevons authored that doesn't directly have anything to do with the marginal revolution. So it opens up, he says, day by day it becomes more evident that the coal we happily possess an excellent quality and abundance is the mainspring of modern material civilization so it's it's interesting the, the analogies between coal in Jevons time and oil in the 20th century it's it's amazing just how much that back then Jevons was taking it for granted that you know the British Empire you know, was a powerhouse that totally depended on not just their institutions the rule of law limited government freedom of the press and so forth, property rights, but also that they had these abundant supplies of coal, and that was what helped fuel their civilization. And But he's saying, oh, there's only so much of it. And he uh, goes through in the book, and it's it's a well-done book. that he, you know It's very uh, scholarly. He goes out and gets the best estimates of coal and surveys experts who really know what they're talking about. And he also recognizes that it's not correct, if you understand economics, to say, oh, we're going to run out of coal by X date. And the same thing, too, when it comes to oil. In our time, if people sometimes worry about peak oil or this, that, and the other thing, it's very naive if somebody says, hey, are we going to run out of oil? That's not the issue. The issue is, is it, is it going to come to be true that because the available quantities of oil that we can extract economically is that equation going to shift such that it's going to become prohibitively expensive to bring additional barrels of crude to market so that the price of gasoline is going to skyrocket and people are going to realize oh wow you know I, I don't even want to drive to the store in my car if it's if it's powered by gasoline because you know it's eighteen dollars a gallon or something right so the point is it's not that every last drop of crude oil that humans know about would disappear, and then we'd say, oh, man, we ran out of oil. Now we're in trouble. It's that as the approach, or sorry, as the end approached, people would see that speculators would go into futures markets, bid up the price of crude oil, and so it would become prohibitively expensive. All right, so, and, and so if your lifestyle was based on cheap oil, then that would come to an end. It's, it's not whether oil would run out per se. So Jevons recognized that in this book. So what he was just arguing, he was, he was warning uh, his fellows that, hey, let's prepare for the fact that at some point, because coal is a finite resource and, and our consumption of it keeps increasing, that we're going to have to keep digging deeper and deeper and spend more and more other resources trying to extract additional quantities of coal. And so this relatively abundant energy source that's right now fueling our civilization is not going to be here forever. So that, that was the, the tenor of his, of his book. So it's interesting at the end when he's trying to step back now and say, okay, so what sort of conclusions do we draw from all this? And I have all this in the, in the excerpts for you guys but I, I, I don't want you to take, a, take away the wrong message. So at one point he says this, and I'm coming in mid-sentence. Will it not appear evident soon after the final adoption of free trade principles that our own resources are just those to which such principles ought to be applied last and most cautiously? 
to part and trade with the surplus yearly interest of the soil may be unalloyed gain, but to disperse so lavishly the cream of our mineral wealth is to be spendthrifts of our capital, to part with that which will never come back. Okay, so here, I just don't, I don't want you to get confused. First of all, what, what is he talking about? What does he mean? That language might be arcane for some of you. He's saying there's a difference. If you have a goose that's laying golden eggs, and I think he even uses this metaphor later on in this passage, if you have a goose that's laying golden eggs, it's one thing to have free trade principles and sell the eggs to the highest bidder, the golden eggs, and then go you know buy whatever you want with the proceeds. That makes sense. You know, and you can enhance your standard of living that way rather than saying, oh, I'm going to keep the eggs for myself and then you know make my own clothes or whatever. But he said it's different to say, wait a minute, why don't I just sell the goose to the highest bidder and then do something that way? Go, that's, that's not as obvious, right? So that, that's what he's getting at there, that free trade, because remember, he's writing at a time when we're in the golden era of free trade as ushered in by the work of the economists, you know, his, his uh, forerunners. Adam Smith and David Ricardo and so forth and Richard Cobden, you know, more in terms of agitation and and being a, a public um, disseminator of these views of the economists and, of course, the work of Bastiat in France and France and others having largely free trade at this period. And that's great. And Jevons is saying here, now you might think after all the stuff I've just gone through, that, yeah, free trade is great when it comes to agriculture, you know, the corn, we get rid of the corn laws, those are silly, but that's because the soil, you know, it's not like we're selling the soil off to foreigners, we're just selling the, the annual produce of the soil, that keeps replenishing itself, whereas if we dig up our coal and ship it abroad, that's not so obvious that that's a smart thing to do, because now we, you know, that's a ton of coal we're never going to have again. It's not like our mines annually just keep reproducing the coal and keep shooting it out indefinitely. So that's what he's getting at there. But I want to stress here, he's just being rhetorical. He's developing this line of thought saying, now you might think this, but then he says, on the other hand, it's hard to, I'm paraphrasing now, it's hard to just come in and piecemeal handicap industrial growth. Right. So even though in this book, I have now shown you some alarming statistics and developed trains of thought to let us know we can't keep this up forever, that something's going to give. It's not obvious that therefore we ought to hamper the growth of industry and pass all sorts of restrictions regulating the uh, mining and selling of coal because he argues that the, all that's going to do is push back the, the inevitable crisis point. So he says that we have to choose, you know, we do have to choose whether we're going to live it up and be great and just a shining beacon to the world in terms of our excellent legal system and civilization powered by coal and our best days are still ahead of us, but then the flame will die out pretty quickly. Or do we limit ourselves now and have a longer period of mediocrity? So he's saying what I've done in this book is showing us that we can't continue in our state of grandeur forever, but I'm not here telling us that the right thing to do is therefore to handicap ourselves and just live in terms of a mediocrity for somewhat longer because even there we're still going to run out of coal or you know economically coal is still going to become prohibitively expensive so anyway that's that's his uh conclusion there where he's he's just trying to uh i guess in our terminology from our vantage point we'd say even though he had a malthusian view of exhaustible natural resources, namely coal, he did not derive necessarily what we would consider to be modern environmentalist policy prescriptions as far as the government and what do we do about this fact. Okay, Jevons' paradox. In the book, Jevons says that you might think that efficiencies in usage of coal might help us. And he points out, though, that, well, not necessarily because we've seen examples where when people become more efficient in using coal, right, so exploiting a given quantity of coal more efficiently such that we get more useful human output from it, then 
that actually increases our appetite for coal because now it's more valuable to us and we want more of it. So in modern times, you see this come up. For example, let's say somebody proposes that the government bump up the cafe standards, the corporate average fuel economy standards, so that car, the new cars coming on the market have to get more miles per gallon, and the government's going to do that. And the person says, oh, this will help Americans reduce fuel consumption, right? It'll, it'll uh, bolster conservation efforts if we make the engines more fuel efficient through government mandate. And so someone might say, well, no, you need to go read up on Jevons' paradox because what could happen is that if you're now driving a car that gets better mileage, you might decide to drive more. You might take longer road trips than you did before. Maybe before you would fly somewhere, but now you're going to drive your car. Or maybe before you wouldn't take a trip, period, because the gas bill would be too much. But now, because your car is so fuel efficient, maybe now you do load the kids into the SUV and drive to grandma's house for you know summer vacation. And so it's possible, pr paradoxically, that by making cars more fuel efficient, people end up consuming more gallons of fuel per year. So that's what Jevons Paradox is, pointing out that possibility. Okay, he's also famous for su what we call sunspot theories. So what Jevons was doing is he thought it was possible that you could explain business crises by analyzing actual sunspots. And so he went and tried to investigate the pattern, or if there were a pattern, between actual sunspots and the price of corn. And so there, at that time, that was plausible. That could have been true because agriculture was such a big component of the economy that maybe variations in solar activity or output could have actual effects on agricultural yields. Banks made loans to farmers with the the fields or the crops being serving as collateral. And so if there was a big crop failure, that could cause a big problems just, you know, for the financial sector too and blah, 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 blah. All right. So that was somewhat plausible. It turned out that Jevons didn't really find any smoking gun. And so it was considered a failure at the time. Nowadays, though, that term sunspot theory, I've seen it used in, in two possible ways. So one way they don't mean it is, Nobody nowadays, when they say sunspot theory, they don't mean literally what if activity on the sun is affecting the economy. Or if they did mean that, they would have to clarify and say, guys, I'm not using this term ironically. I literally mean I have a sunspot theory of economics right now, blah, 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 blah. And then they would say what it was. So one way to use it is just to be like a put down. right? So if you dismiss something and say, oh, that's a sunspot theory, what you mean is that it's a spurious theory that's based on a, on fallacious patterns, right? That somebody thinks he sees patterns in something and you're saying, no, you're just seeing stuff. There's nothing there. There's nothing really causal going on there. That if you saw some pattern for this past event, you know, the stock market crashed because you, you noticed a drop off and people go into this certain type of nightclub. Don't think you've discovered some causal pattern. That's just a fluke. And, and so you might call that a sunspot theory or something just as a put down as an allusion back to Jevons, who thought he saw something that turned out not to be there. However, there's another way of using it that some economists have been publishing on the possibility that you could have a totally, quote, rational model of the economy where all the agents use Bayes law and they update information correctly and they have well-defined utility functions. They maximize their utility correctly, given the information they have at the time. Firms maximize profits correctly, blah, blah, blah. General equilibrium, all the bells and whistles. But yet, the way the model's constructed, there's some external random variable that once it has its realization and people see it, they might choose one equilibrium or the other based on that external random variable that doesn't intrinsically affect the fundamentals of the economy in this little model that they've built. And so there you could have real economic uh, results, like stock prices going up or down or what have you, unemployment going up or down, business activity changing based on some external thing, 
that really doesn't directly affect the economy. So there shouldn't be this causal connection, but just because people, given their state of their beliefs and whatever, are primed a certain way, you could have this self-fulfilling prophecy where something happens and it causes real effects in the economy and everybody correctly thinks that's going to happen and it does come true. And so you could call that a sunspot theory. Again, in reference back to uh, a whimsical reference to Jevons' original literal sunspot theory. All right, so in that kind of a model, again, it's nobody, no individual is doing anything irrational, even though in terms of the system as a whole, it's kind of odd that something that shouldn't have any impact is causing demonstrable impacts in the in the economy, or at least the, the economy as built in the little mathematical model of The Economist. Okay, let me now just spend some time on for what this course's purposes is the most uh, relevant thing that Jevons did, and that's his work, of course, in helping to usher in what we now call the marginal revolution. So I've, I've given you some really good excerpts for the course notes for this lecture, so... I'm not going to say if you just read one thing, plus I think I've already said that, so I can't say it again, right? But it, it is, if you're, if you're just going to read a few things, you might want to consider reading Jevons' uh, work from his 1871 book that I put in the course notes for this, because he's a very clear writer. He quotes um, previous economists, especially if you're really an eager beaver, a good student, go ahead and go to the, the link I've given you to just read longer passages from his, his book because he goes through and quotes a lot of the earlier classical economists and shows, hey, they, they were close here, but the problem is, duh, 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 and here's a better way to think about it. So it really is good for a history of economics thought course for you to dive into Jevons' work there if you're, if you're curious. So one thing that I liked is he's got this passage where he explains really what the benefit of exchange is now from the vantage point of subjective value theory. So he says... It is a most important result of this theory, meaning the theory he's been developing in the book, that the ratio of exchange gives no indication of the real benefit derived from the action of exchange. So many trades are occupied in buying and selling and make their profits by buying low and selling high that there arises a fallacious tendency to believe that the whole benefit of trade depends upon the differences of prices. It is implied that to pay a high price is worse than doing without the article. All right, so that's beautiful right there. Make, let me make sure you understand what he's saying. And this kind of ties into Rothbard's point that the real innovation here was the subjective element, not the marginality element. That Jevons is saying, this theory I've been developing now in his 1871 book shows us that, yeah, I've explained how, how people mentally value things and now I've been showing how they interact with each other in the marketplace to give rise to objective exchange ratios. So I can explain why one stagecoach trades for 18 horses or whatever. But he says those objective exchange ratios don't by themselves really tell us about the benefit of exchange. And so, really, the benefit of exchange, it's, it's in your mind. It's subjective. And in particular, when two people voluntarily trade, they both walk away better. So he, he, this is me talking now. Let me just make sure you guys get this. If, one sta if it turns out that one stagecoach trades for 18 horses, the, you could say the market value of one stagecoach is equal to the market value of 18 horses. But that doesn't mean there's a single person in the economy who thinks one stagecoach has as much value as 18 horses in that respect, right? That really what happens when the owner of the stagecoach trades for the 18 horses, he thinks the 18 horses at that moment, given his value scale, gives him more utility than the stagecoach does. That's why he trades. But at the same time, the other guy on the other side of the trade thinks the stagecoach would give him more utility than those 18 horses. And that's why he trades. All right, so it's a, a difference in valuation at the margin that motivates trade, even though when we observe when in equilibrium, if you will, 
what the exchange ratio is objectively. That's what we mean by market price. And so what Jevons is talking about in this passage, too, he's saying there's a lot of businesses who make their living by seeing some commodity at what they think is a low price, buying it, and then either selling it somewhere else or just waiting for prices to rise and then selling it. All right. So if you see a stock that you think, oh, that's undervalued, and you buy it, and then the price goes up and you sell it, or you're buying commodities in one spot at a low price, and then you because you ship them across town where you realize the price is better, and you're earning that arbitrage or near arbitrage, you're guessing, you're not certain, then Jevons is saying it's clear how those people are earning a living from that, but don't think that the way you profit from trade per se is, oh, you go find something that's low and buy it and then sell it later for a higher price. That's just one little aspect of how certain people earn income, but trade per se, every voluntary trade makes both parties better off in their minds. And not just because, oh, I'm going to go sell this thing later to somebody else. Okay, and then I will end with Jevons' discussion uh, of price determination. So at one point, he tries to alleviate any confusion, and he boils it down to what's called tabular form. I guess he's thinking he's setting it up at a table. And he says, so if you're not looking at this, he, he writes these as three separate lines, right? So he'll have three statements, and then he has semicolons after the first two. And so he's, he's trying to, like, set it apart. for this. So if you were just scanning through his book, you would see it set apart. So he's drawing attention to this to say these are three principles to summarize how I'm saying we, should, we as economists should think about the interaction of cost and production, labor quantity, um, the supply of goods and value and price. Okay. So he says, cost of production determines supply, semicolon. Supply determines final degree of utility, semicolon. Final degree of utility determines value. Okay. So again, that's a pretty famous summary that Jevons gives of his system. In the course notes for this lecture, I've given you not just the paragraph or the section that contains this, but also the preceding one and then the one following it. They're pretty short bursts, just so you can see the context. And it's it's worth reading just to reinforce the distinction between the old classical approach and now this new marginal subjective approach. So let me just spend a few minutes in the time we have left for this lecture talking about that. So Jevin starts out saying... Look, the labor theory of value that the classical economists used, it, it can't even begin to explain the price or the value we assign to non-reproducible items, right? So, so antique furniture or some painting from a dead master or some old coin, that these things, we value them, we can sell them in the marketplace, prices are determined for them, and yet clearly the labor theory of value has nothing to say about these things, that the prices fluctuate and so on, and that has nothing to do with how much labor was embodied in them. That is an irrelevant fact. If we forgot, or if we just don't know how much labor went into it, does that mean we're at a loss of how to value this stuff? Of course not. So clearly he's saying the principles of valuation and price determination cannot be exhausted by something like the labor theory of value, because there's this whole class of items to which it's inapplicable. And he says, furthermore, even the things to which it, we do think it applies, things that are reproducible and that are made day after day by the application of new labor, it's still the case that the actual market price of those things bounces all over the place. That, yeah, you can talk about the long-run natural price, that's like an anchor to which those things might gravitate, but it's clear that on any given day, the actual market price is not pinned down by how much labor went into this thing, or even more generally, what's the cost of production. So he's underscoring saying, clearly there's something else at work. And what he ends up doing is saying, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a theoretical framework that explains those actual fluctuations 
right? I, I want to come up with a framework that explains at any given moment what, how do people value something? And then when they interact with each other in a marketplace, what principles pin down the equilibrium price ratios? And then he says, when I give you that, I can then incorporate the stuff about long run reproducibility and labor cost and cost of, of production and explain those patterns that the classical economists had noticed. But my framework is much more comprehensive. So remember in the lecture on the marginal, where we started the marginal revolution, I guess it was the first Carl Menger lecture. I was drawing the analogy with physics and saying how Einstein's approach displaced Isaac Newton's because Einstein could explain everything Newton could and more. And so that's what I'm saying is happening here, that the new approach that Jevons and Menger and Walras gave could explain all the stuff that the classical approach could handle and it could explain a lot more. So what, and we're going to see when we get to Alfred Marshall, the what's considered to be standard view as to the interaction between supply and demand, or what some people might say is the interaction between subjective marginal utility versus objective cost of production or, you know, real resource constraints. So I just want to, I'll probably stress it again when we get to there, but I want to just say again right now, or say in anticipation right now, the Austrians, have a minority view on this. And as you can guess, I'm sympathetic to the Austrian view. I think that they ultimately have have the right view. But I just want to stress this. that So even though Jevons, Walras, and Menger are all pioneers in the so-called marginal revolution, their perspectives are not identical. Menger stressed the subjective element more than the other two did. And especially if you look at the treatment like in Alfred Marshall, where he famously um, you know, says that supply and demand are like twin blades of a scissors. And so you can't really talk about price formation just with one or the other. Uh, the Austrians are more stressing that no, everything in the market is ultimately traced back to subjective valuation. All right, so we will come back to that. But I just wanted to make sure you weren't uh, pushed in the wrong direction at this point. So what I'm talking about right now is Jevons view where he says, look, the, we know the labor theory of value can't be right. At any given moment, if you tell me how many units there are of a particular commodity and you tell me what the value scale is, the, the subjective preferences are of an individual who's valuing those units, I can walk through issues of final degree of utility, what we would now call margin utility, to explain the value placed on any particular unit of that stockpile of the commodity, right? It's because it, it matters. You know, so water has a very low value to us because any particular unit of it doesn't satisfy some end that is really important. If you took that unit of water away, we'd be in trouble. Right, so that it's so supply, the amount available does affect final degree of utility. Okay. Now that's the the avenue by which cost of production indirectly influences final degree of utility and ultimately value. And then the you know, prices in the marketplace. All right. So if something is if if something costs a hundred dollars to pr to produce, and right now there's so much of that thing that, given people's margin utilities and so on, they assign a very low value to it and they don't pay very much for it, and so the market clearing price is only eighty dollars. Well, what's going to happen? Well, the producers are going to stop making so much of it, and then the supply available is going to dwindle eventually and then because of the lower supply now given people subjective value scales oh the final degree of utility for that item that commodity now is going to be higher because there's less of it available and then that means its value will be higher that will interact with other people in the economy so the market clearing price will be higher 
and it you know that process will continue until the thing the price gets to be about a hundred dollars all right so that's the the mechanism by which um, Jevons can take the wisdom and the patterns that the classical economists had focused on and incorporate that into his system. So he's saying, yeah, it's not that cost of production or labor per se is totally irrelevant, has no influence on price, of course not. But he thought the problem with the classical school is they thought there was like a direct causal relationship. And again, it depended on which writer you were reading, some of them more so than others. But they just were were starting off on the wrong foot. They thought that ultimately when one good was twice as expensive as another good in the market, it must be because there's twice as much of something in that first good. And what was it? Well, a natural thing was to suppose labor power quantified in some way. And that was the wrong thing to do. What you needed to start out with was to realize value is in the mind. And yes, the available quantity of something can affect the marginal utility. And so then when you realize that, oh, okay. And so if cost of production compared to retail price influences how much more of that stuff are people going to make and bring to market, now you see the connection. All right, so that's the, uh, the system Jevons gave us. Let me just read it again. Cost of production determines supply. Supply determines final degree of utility. Final degree of utility determines value. That was Jevons' famous summary of the system he was developing in his uh, very important 1871 book. That's all the time we have for this lecture. I will see you guys next time.